I'm not sure when I first began to have the idea that I was going to take a pumpkin and cut it up and try to make some soup and pies from scratch. It may have been while I helped with the youth and saw all those lovely pumpkins in the corner, patiently waiting for the annual ritual of the carving of the jack-o'-lantern, the time when we allow kids to have sharp knives and to generally make a mess strewing the seeds all over a table for the youth group leaders to clean up later. Or it might have been when I decided to help with the pumpkin bowling and watched with the kids waiting to see if a pumpkin which was rolling down towards the pens might actually break open, like fans at a NASCAR race hoping for a wreck. Pumpkins, pumpkins, pumpkins. Everywhere pumpkins. Youth group events are nothing if not inefficient. Think of all the happy, fluffy marshmallows that give their lives every year in games of chubby bunnies, only to end up as a gloopy mess at the bottom of a trash can. Or think of the soda bottles that are used for pumpkin bowling, or the ones that are just drunk. All that sugar, and cookies, and potato chips, yeah, all often have to be cleaned up by the youth group leader as well. Do you see a pattern beginning to emerge here? Or think of the apples used for bobbing for apples. They have a one-time use pretty much, unless the kid decides to eat them. The kids bob for them, they eagerly bring them back up, and then they're thrown away. The family I grew up in wasn't crazy about inefficiency, particularly the wasting of food. So it's taken me a little bit of a time to realize some of the good ends that this wastage in youth group can accomplish. It can kind of add to a sort of atmosphere of controlled craziness, where kids get to blow off steam, get to mess around, where kids get to be silly. There are many purposes to youth group, but one of them is to create an atmosphere of acceptance where kids can just be themselves. And if wasting a little bit of food... If carving up pumpkins or using them for bowling or having a lot of food around where kids can just eat it and snack at it all night, well, if that takes a little bit of wastage, well, I think it's okay by me. The pumpkins in these pictures are all courtesy of the youth group of New City, St. Louis. Yep, that's the arch carved in that pumpkin. Aren't kids amazing? No, really this essay is about what happened next. What happened when the youth group leader allowed me to take some pumpkins home. And when I decided to unleash my inner pioneer pilgrim, whatever, and decided to make some pies and soup. One of the benefits of doing something inefficiently, like making your own pumpkin puree, is that you learn something. For example, I knew that the pumpkin had strings inside of it with the seeds, but I had no idea that the flesh could be as stringy as, say, something like spaghetti squash. This is especially true of larger, pithier pumpkins. When I looked on the internet for recipes on how to make pumpkin puree, a lot of them called for roasting the pumpkin. But if you've got a big cast iron pot, then you can probably just cut it up like I did, put some water on the bottom, and steam it. What you end up with is pumpkin pieces that are really soft. This one's got a little bit of a burntness up to the bottom. But really what you want is a well-cooked pumpkin pieces that you can just scoop out with a spoon. The cooked skin just peels off easily, leaving you large, soft chunks. Then you can take your hand blender and mash these up. You could do it in a food processor, too but I imagine you wouldn't want to make it too, too fine. If you're a pumpkin seed eater too, you can dry these. I had planned on roasting the pumpkin seeds after they dried, but I found that just drying them was fine. You could eat them and they tasted great. Finally, after you've got your puree to an even consistency, just scoop it into some freezer bags. I kept mine in the fridge for a couple of days before I used it. And I think if you wanted to freeze it, it'd freeze up pretty well. When you're done, you might notice that the yellow color of the pumpkin is not nearly as dark as the cans from the store. I'm not sure what they do at the factory. Maybe they just cook it longer, or perhaps they cook the skin with it. I was a little bit worried that my pies would turn out that yellow insipid color and not the rich brown color, but I didn't have to worry. It was several days before I used the pumpkin puree, and by that time I had my video camera back from alone. Rooting around on the internet, the pun entirely intended, I discovered that the recipes that I liked best involved root vegetables. So I made my introduction with rutabaga and parsnips, vegetables that I had never used before. I also decided to add some carrots and a sweet potato. Cutting up these vegetables, I realized just how tough the rutabaga was. In fact, it did one of my old peelers in. 
Finally, I was able to get all the vegetables cut up and put into my big orange pot. I added some onions and some garlic powder and some salt, and I began to cook them with some water. Once the vegetables have cooked for a while, it's time to add the broth. For this recipe, I added two cartons of chicken broth. I actually used a no salt version this time. In the past, I've been a little bit of a salty sort of cooker. But as gourmet chefs already know, really, no salt is the way to go. And then you can control the amount of salt later on. If you want to use a vegan or a vegetarian recipe, you can use a vegetable stock at this point. Once the vegetables were soft, it was time for the hand blender again, which was a $4 find from the thrift store. You could do it in a food processor, but it's nice to be able to keep the food in the pot. So you need a hand blender that's able to take the heat. Make sure you do it thoroughly so that all the lumps are taken out of the soup. After the addition of some butter to the mixture, it's time to move on to the main event, to pull out the pumpkin puree from the fridge and to mix it into the soup. Since the pumpkin puree was in an airtight Ziploc bag, you've noticed that it's kept its color in the fridge. This process takes a little while. Even though the pumpkin is cooked, you want to cook it and blend it with all the other vegetables. So I've speeded up the video here. In addition to stirring it and cooking it, in a minute I'll add some more butter yet, so the recipe gets less and less healthy. Then after that, some spices. For this autumnal soup, really the best spice to add is nutmeg. It gives it a nice warm spicy flavor. And I also added some sea salt. And then finally some um, black pepper from a grinder. And really, it's just that simple. You really don't need to add that many more spices. You can add curry to a pumpkin soup, which tastes great, but really it takes it in a completely different direction. One of the pleasures of making this soup and taking all the time is to listen to the things like a pepper grinder and to hear the scrape of the spoon against the bottom of the pan and to see the warm ochre color of the pumpkin with the paisley swirls of the spices, like crazy autumnal fractals. In a soup like this, a little garlic powder goes a long way, but I did want to warm it up a little bit and give it some extra touch. Perhaps the most visually satisfying part of the process of making pumpkin soup is stirring in the cream. And by now you realize that pumpkin soup is really not a health food. When you put the cream in though and you begin to stir, you get these wonderful patterns like the top of a latte at a coffee shop. Or kind of like Starry Night, only in pumpkin. And that's pretty much it. Making pumpkin soup is really quite simple. And it's pretty simple to cook your own pumpkin too and make the puree. It just takes a while. It stores up really well and you can make a warm, satisfying pumpkin soup pretty quickly. I could go through the process of showing you how I made the pies, but really I don't really want to bore you. It involves more mixing with my precious little hand blender. And also, you should note though, that if you are using a homemade puree for a pumpkin pie, but you want to look up a recipe on the internet that takes into account the difference in viscosity. Homemade puree is a little bit more viscous than the stuff you get from the store. So look up a recipe that takes that into account, otherwise your pie might not set up quite right.
In the final analysis, it was all it was worth it all, the supposed inefficiency. It was great to be able to make food that tasted good enough to want to share with friends. I would never imagine making pumpkin soup with canned pumpkin, and the pies tasted so fresh. And in the end, the journey of the pumpkins ended where it began. I took the big pot of soup over to some dear friend's house in order to celebrate a birthday. We all had brought food to share, and we tucked in. And after we had all had our fill, we pulled the pies out of the oven, brewed the coffee, whipped the cream, and enjoyed the fellowship that only good friends can bring. Very good. Yeah, not too spicy? It's very good, yeah. I love it spicy. Spicy? <laughs> it tastes like a lot of ginger. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. What were you saying? Feel spicy? free to have desserts. I'm having a food breather.